Uh, we talked about a, several topics related to pumps, pumps that add that add um, head, add energy head. We've had the term included in our energy equation, and we've gotten to sort of the, the practical part where you say, we've got this system, we've got this pump. What happens when we turn the pump on? What flow will be delivered through the system? And to do that, you, you find this thing called the pump operating point. And so you come up with two pieces of information. This is where you, we said last time you put those two, two curves on one figure and then yeah, okay. find the intersection. Okay. Yeah. I was trying to shorten it. And now we're going to do, if you're, if you're following on the notes, then now we're to the, the um, first page of um, today's notes. And we're going to do an actual problem. So, and you who are here, if you could help supply me the information on the pump, or the system characteristics. Um, that the difference in elevations is 200 feet. say that this is a, um, we're assume fully rough, that is, this friction factor is not a function of the Reynolds number. That makes the problem solving simpler, okay? system to 
we can get a, a pump performance curve. And what do I do? I do a, a hundred. Oh, 100, 150. 100, 150. 200. 200. And then three and 400. And they go from, as I recall, the most is 200 feet down to zero. Mm. Oh, sorry, 400. Hmm. I think I might have messed that up later in the, in the, in the lecture, but we'll see. Okay, and it goes down to 350. 350. 315. 315. 275. 275. 175. 175. All right. And so what we're looking to do then is take that information on the system and come up with a, another column that is the head required. And to do that, we um, use our um, energy equation. And so um, if we have a energy equation written between locations one and two, with the usual simplifications that we make that the gauge pressures at both reservoirs is zero and, uh, um, and as, is the, as is the velocity head, we'll get um, Z1 plus the head that's required for a particular situation that is, is equal to Okay, so that's our simplified, simplified version of the. And what we need to do then is to come up with an equation for this. So we have that that's Darcy Weisbach equation modified to include minor losses. And then for a circular pipe, we know that so we make all of that simplification So all of this stuff that's a function of the system, we can combine into a constant K and then say that the, and then substitute that back in our energy equation also substitute that the difference in elevations is um, the delta Z we'll get that the head required in general is the, the elevation difference between the two re reservoirs and this term that varies according to the flow. And we plug in values for our particular situation. And that's what I think we need here. Yes, there it is. That um, T 
200 plus 1.393, and those Q's are in um, CFS. All right, and that's the equation that we can use get the system from All right, and I've calculated the head required at the various Q's, and let me, I should put units on this. And that's, that's what the 200, the 200 is here, right? Mm -hmm. And then it goes upward from there. 239. 239? Yep. Okay. Keep going there. 288. Liam. 357. 357. 554. 554. 829. 829. It has the look that we expect it to have is that it starts at a non-zero value, and then as we add hundreds, you know, we're adding 39 here. Um, we're adding, um, from there to there, we're adding more than 100 feet necessary. Uh, from there to there, it's, you know, almost 200 feet. From there to there, it's almost 300 feet. That's the concave upward uh, shape to the curve that we're expecting. And then, rather than plotting the two and finding the intersection, what I did was to say, let's just compare the head required and the head added. Is the head added greater than the head required? If we look at those, we'd say, yes, there's more head than we need. So we will get some flow. At 100, 100 CFS, there's still more head than we need. At 150, more head than we need. Uh, but note that at 200, we don't have enough head to get us 200 CFS. Likewise, for 300 and 400, it would take more head than our pump can supply at that flow rate. So, and what that means is that our Q is somewhere between 150 and 200. All right, and that's a, a, an example problem in finding the pump operating point. I don't think it's necessary to get the exact value. You could do it with some sort of um, Interpolation, you know, assuming assume that they are linearly varying between the two, or however you'd like to do it. But um, at that middle value, uh, you think it's closer to 150 than 200, just because these are pretty close and those are uh, not so close to one another. All right, questions on finding the pump operating point? All right, well, let's go on. Oh yeah, there's, um, now we're gonna consider what happens when we put pumps together into a system. All right, so, Because I, have you been to the Mallard Creek wastewater treatment plant as part of the environmental class? 
Have you been to a pump station? I guess that. Shereen, have you been to a pump station? Mm -hmm. And how many pumps did you see at the pump station? Three. Three. Yeah, they always have more than one. Mm -hmm. Particularly if they're pumping wastewater. But it, uh, because you do not want to have a failure that means you can't pump wastewater. If you're pumping drinking water up to a water tower and then it has gravity flow to customers, I could see perhaps uh, not having a, a multiple pumps, but you usually do. And the, the way they, they turn on and off pumps to handle the changes in flows that are necessary through the day. That's typically how they're handled. So we as civil engineers need to know how those, um, how the pump curves uh, can be calculated when you have multiple pumps. So um, we have that pump curve. Imagine we were going to take two possibility. I have the ones in series on the left, right? Yeah. Say uh, two pumps in series versus two pumps in parallel. So this looks like like that. This looks like that. And it's similar in it's similar conceptually to two pipes in series. So um, just as we would double, we would add the flows for a particular uh, head loss in a branch. In for two pumps in parallel, we double the Q at a given. Head added when we're going from one pump to two of the same pumps being put together. Because each pump can, at a given added head, can supply its particular flow rate, and those can be combined together to give a total that's twice what one pump can provide. On the other hand, Two in series, each adds its own head added at a particular flow, so we get uh, two times we um, we double the head added at a given Q. All right, and from that we could take our one pump and say, okay, let's make a pump curve. For these two situations uh, made by two of those pumps in this configuration. So what we would do here is just say, okay, we're going to double the Q's for every head added. So we go 400 Head added now we double the Q, so that's um, zero, two hundred, four hundred, six hundred, eight hundred. All right, does that make sense? You see what I'm doing here? All right. And likewise, we can make the same pump curve, a different pump curve, but the same method by doubling the head added at each of the cues. So here we go, zero, and then we double the head added. So the 400 becomes 800. The 350 becomes 700. The 315 becomes 630. 550. 
350 and 0. All right. And then hopefully that's what I've done here. I'm going to go to the next page of my notes. Let's see if I did that. I think we can, we can then say, okay, what if we had two pumps and we wanted to find the operating point of our system, of our pump? If we put two of the, our two pumps in parallel versus our two pumps in um, series. So the way I did this was to say, Of a and then h sub a greater than okay for that particular um, system curve. So this is um, two in series. So we've got, we don't have enough. And um, here, uh, 300, we've got, different numbers. There was a difference when I got to 200. All right, didn't I say no for two in series 
at 200 357 2 in parallel at 200 we get 350 2 Oh, oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's my problem. You should have, you know, I made the same error when I was at, did this the first time. I um, don't have quite enough head here, right? I need three, I have 350, but I need 357, okay? That's where I messed up. So, So that estimated um, pump operating point for two in parallel is somewhere in this range, between 150 and 200. And the operating point for the two in series is slightly higher, somewhere something more than 200. So it's somewhere in here is the operating point. And so that's a recognition that for particular systems, uh, it's not necessarily equivalent to take two pumps and put them in one configuration or the other. What we found was if we put two in series, we were going to get a slightly higher flow than if we put two in parallel. Okay? Follow all of that? All right. Good. Good, good. So two more topics to talk about in this um, quick survey of, of pumps and pump systems. We're next going to talk about uh, bad that can happen to your pumps called cavitation. Cavitation. I'll explain it in a minute. But um, the point is that, that in a pump performance curve, you might see a fourth line that's plotted as a function of Q and is around about zero uh, that is labeled NPSH. And that stands for the net net positive suction head. Well, what's that all about? If you were to look at, and you were to look at what's going on as water goes through a pump, so we had some sort of little pressure sensor that could actually ride along with the fluid and measure the local pressure head. see, and we're doing that from the inlet to the outlet side of our pump. And let's just say that these are absolute pressures that we're looking at.
what you see is something like this. This is what's called the suction side of the pump. That is the water leading up to the impeller. As the water gets sucked in, literally sucked into the impeller and then pushed out the other side, there will be a momentary decrease in the pressure as the water uh, picks up in velocity. Typically they have um, narrow channels so the water um, accelerates and then decelerates to convert that added energy back to pressure head. The difference from the inlet to the outlet side is our head that we're adding. But um, what can happen is that um, you can get less than the vapor pressure head. So you can get cases where this uh, absolute pressure falls below the corresponding vapor pressure for water at that temperature. That's what you're trying to avoid. Because if your absolute pressure gets less than the vapor pressure, bad stuff happens. We get um, this as they say in the text, the, the water boils, that is the liquid water becomes water vapor. Uh, it's, um, that's what cavitation is. That's uh, water vaporizing on the suction side of your pump. What's, um, what's bad about that reduces our pump efficiency that is the impeller pushing on the on the water vapor is not going to transfer kinetic energy the same way it would if it was pushing on the water so it'll overall reduce the pump efficiency Is those as those little bubbles go um, from the suction side to the discharge side, the pressure goes up and the bubbles suddenly collapse. And that sudden collapsing uh, can actually um, damage the impellers themselves. It's um, it's not a, it's not the same thing as um, detonation in a in an internal combustion engine, but it's that same sort of uh, momentary sudden change in pressures that the pump's not designed to do that can have a similar sort of damage that you would get from a, a pinging um, internal combustion energy uh, engine. So we would like to prevent that. And to do that, To, pre to, uh, to prevent cavitation, what we do is we calculate this quantity, the net positive suction head. And 
And we know that the absolute pressure is just the gauge pressure. The gauge pressure plus the atmospheric pressure. So we separately calculate those things. Add the velocity head on the suction side because that's available energy that could be transferred uh, potentially to pressure and then subtract off whatever is the vapor pressure head. And what we try to do is um, we want this NPSH that we calculate to be above a minimum required value that comes uh, from our pump curve. So I'll do an example of that. And you might wonder, uh, Anybody get their water from a well? Okay. And where is the pump in your system? Okay, but and exactly where is it? Is it near the surface or not? Okay. <laughs> Just by the way, I but what you really the honest answer is I don't know. You don't know. Okay. Well, it turns out that the, the pumps in that system are not near the surface, right? They are, they are down deep uh, because um, if they, uh, they need to be deep to prevent cavitation. And, and I'll, show you, I'll show you an example of that. Or somewhere in the line, uh, and the deeper they are, the better. So at this particular flow rate, You know, I'm going to go back. It's 10 feet. My notes say 15, but it, down below it says 10. Uh, so change that at the top of page 4, top of page 4 to 10. So this is what we get from our pump curve. That whatever this Q is, we um, need to have it a net positive suction head that's at least 10 feet. And this lift uh, might vary. Say if this is a groundwater well, you know, this is underground and that's the groundwater table, you might have a pipe that goes way down here and when it gets dry, the water level goes down and the lift to the pump gets greater. But we're just gonna say for now that it's lifting the water 10 feet. This is all given. We're also going to say that the uh, head loss is three feet at that particular Q. You know, um, we know that uh, in general, the head loss is a function of the flow. In fact, it's a function of the flow squared. But we're just gonna set that value as our 
Okay, and then we're going to calculate calculate these things. These two numbers we have to look up based upon you know typical atmospheric pressures and um, vapor pressures at our particular temperatures and these will get will calculate from what we always use, the energy equation. So we, like we always do, we take two locations and write the energy equation between them. But we'll call this, the, this location is at the suction side of this pump. saying that this is the pressure in PSI that we convert to pounds per square foot and divide by the specific weight in pounds per cubic foot to get the atmospheric pressure head as 33.9 feet. And then also look up the vapor pressure head as half a PSI do the same sort of calculation and get that. Okay, and then write the energy equation between and no head added because we're we're only looking at the, the, the this side upstream of our pump. This is location S. gauge pressures here as we do in our we note that all of these values are zero this we're given at three feet that we're given at ten feet and what you get is that sum of the pressure head and the velocity head on the suction side is negative 13 feet. And then we plug that value into our 
NPSH, which takes these two terms, minus 13P, adds, adds, and then adds the atmospheric pressure head and subtracts off the vapor pressure head. And so what do we see? Have we, is our NPSH high enough to prevent cavitation? Yes, it is. Now, what if we changed nothing but lowered the reservoir by, let's just say that, um, say um, Z1 equals minus 10. Okay. The only thing we change is this elevation. Everything else stays the same. It, we would take 10 feet away from this, right? Mm -hmm. Because Z1 now becomes minus 10, and it'd be, these two are now minus 23. Okay, so, that would give and in that case, oops, forgot the pain. In that case, if the elevation dropped ten feet on the on the inlet side, you could get cavitation. And that's the sort of calculations you have to make when you're concerned about um, cavitation. There's one more topic that we're not going to get to. Uh, it's only a couple of pages in my notes, and there is the online lecture. It's called um, the, I think there's a, I th believe there's a um, homework problem on it called the uh, um, specific speed of a pump, uh, which is a dimensionless number you can calculate to decide if, given your conditions, whether a radial pump or a mixed flow pump or an axial flow pump is preferred for your situation. Uh, so look at those notes or read the text and you'll get some practice when the, with the homework problems. We'll, we'll end it there.